excuse me, like just readjust. Most of today's have concentrated on to our parish churches presented by the challenges of funding in an era of, era of falling congregations. But it's not just the buildings that are at risk. Our churches contain a virtual treasury of historic artifacts, be they stained glass, windows, and other metalwork, fabric hangings, woodwork, paintings, and so much more. Two monuments are just one category of church treasures at risk, but what I have to say about them is illustrative of other artefacts also. The sense in which monuments are unique is their legal status. Most of the contents of the churches are in the custody of the parish and subject, of course, to the faculty jurisdiction legislation and do what they choose to alter, conserve, sometimes sell them. Monuments are not, however, owned by the church in which they were erected. There is a very long case history uh, of law object dating back to Lady Alice Witch's case of 1469. Following her the death of Sir Jehu Witch, a former Lord Mayor of London, she had set up a two monuments for him in the Chancel of St Margaret's Lothbury in London. It doesn't survive as the church was destroyed by fire, but we do know that heraldic funeral armour, including a coat armour, silk pen and sword, hung about the tomb. The rector of the church, the Reverend Thomas Tonley, took the funeral armour down. He thought he was justified in doing so on the grounds that the chancel was his freehold. Lady Witch took a miss and brought a bill of trespass in the king's bench and her case prevailed, the judgment being that a person placing chattels in a church as a memorial did not lose his or her private property in them. Since then, it has become firmly established monuments belong to the heir at law of the person commemorated. Even, as in the case of many monuments, the heir at law uh, the, or the person commemorated by the monument is unknown or the heir at law cannot be traced, the church still has no rights in the monument. Ownership then devolves to the crown as personified for the treasury solicitor. I think this is a fact, but it has important implications as to what can and can't be done with church monuments. It should mean that congregations have no right to sell monuments or parts of them, such as statuary busts or associated funeral armour, even if they have a dire need for funds. This was certainly judged in the case when, in 1976, the rector of church and church wardens of St. Andrew Thornborough, near Peterborough, sought a faculty authorising them to sell the spectacular Justing helmet of circa 1520, which had hung above the tomb of William Lord Russell of Thornhaugh, who died in 1613. It was after this case that the ownership of the, all its accoutrements remain um, the property of the heir at law to Lord Russell. Accordingly, the consistory court had no jurisdiction to grant a faculty to the petitioners for the sale of the ham helmet. However, in the same period, a faculty was granted for the sale of an early 16th century Flemish or Italian Justing helmet, which was part of the funerary accoutrements associated with the two monuments at Broadwater in Sussex, of Sir Thomas West, the 8th Baron de la War, who died in 1529. It was originally fixed with a contemporaneous chain, front and back, for securing to the monument. The helmet was purchased in, at Sotheby's in February 1974 for 22,000, in his, no, in the Royal Armouries. Sadly, the reality is that faculties are parts of monuments, as I said, usually funeral armour or portrait parts, do still get granted, sometimes because of uh, ignorance of the legal position. A notorious recent case concerns the sale auction on the 8th of December 2010 of the Wooden St. Lawrence Armit for £55,800, including VAT. 
This was following the issue of a faculty by the Winchester Diocesan Advisory Committee, by the Chancellor on the advice of the Diocesan Advisory Committee. Although the armour is in itself an important piece of historic armour, dating from circa 1500, and loaned to the Royal Armouries for some, mainly to guard against um, it, its theft, its use as a piece of funeral armour, um, it, it formed together with a pair of spurs, a pair of gauntlets and a dagger, an essential component of the ensemble of the church monument to Sir Thomas, who died in 1677. Moreover, in this case, in granting the faculty, the DAC and Chancellor failed properly to adhere to the faculty jurisdiction rules, and in particular, the obligatory consultation with the Church Buildings Council was admitted. After widespread criticism and pressure from the CBC, the Chancellor cancelled the faculty. This was after the auction. Uh, a new hearing is planned, but regrettably, date has yet to be arranged. There have been a lot of delays from the parish who are trying to bolster their case, and I think some from the Chancellor, though the CBC have been pressing for it to take case. The sad history of this case is nothing short of a disgrace and a scandal. Examples such as this act to undermine ecclesiastical exemption, which I hope we would all agree is really important to churches. The CBC has since issued excellent new guidelines on the sale of church treasures, which, if adhered to, I hope will guard against further abuse of the system. I should put a very unusual case. I'm not suggesting this sort of um, experience is at all widespread, but there is certainly a degree of uh, lack of consistency um, between different dioceses. Just as the intrinsic value of monuments gives PCCs, or some PCCs, a welcome ideas of selling the maze funds, it also makes monument a target for thieves. As I see it, there are two key factors at work here. It concerns insecure fixing of monuments which provide an opportunity for thieves. The church authorities at Dauncey were warned by the MBS that the brass on the left to Dame Anne Dauncey, died 1539, was insecure. No remedial action was taken, and in 2004 it was stolen and has not been seen since. This loss is particularly distressing. It was unique in its icon. All there is now in the church is a replica, nice but not the real thing. Secure fixing can deter thieves. At Holbeach in Lincolnshire, an attempt was made to steal the brass to Joan Welby, died 1488, but all they managed to do, achieve, was to bend um, the instrument plate. Um, you can just see it lifting up at one corner. This, of course, can expire conservator. Two carved monuments from last summer were also insecure. At Newland in Gloucester, the thieves took the top section of a broken late 14th century effigy of a priest, which was lying loose on a wooden support. Shortly afterwards, thieves, I suspect the same lot, struck at Carfroom, removing a delightful military demi-effigy holding a heart, a heart burial probably commemorating Adam de Lacey, died of 1297. As you can see, there was a large crack behind the effigy and another towards the bottom right hand side of, of it. Um, they would still have had to chisel it away, but life was made all too easy. Greater Sikip might have saved these monuments, but it's not always the case. In the same per period, in the same general area, monuments were stolen from Abbey Dore, Gromont and Foy. At Abbey Dore, the thieves removed this stone plaque, which since I took these photographs had been cured by metal brackets that held it in place. But the thieves came equipped to steal the metal brackets were left in place, so um, they clearly came, they knew what they wanted, they knew it was fixed, and they knew how to get rid of it, um, the fixing. Targeted thefts of this sort are especially hard to guard against. Portrait busts are another popular target for thieves, especially as most are not secured to the rest of the monument. 
There are some uh, solutions adapted adopted by conservators, including security fixings with strong stainless steel threaded bars that are set in epoxy resin and go into the bottom of the bust and the top of the base. The disadvantages include that this interferes with the integrity of the monument, could possibly damage it, though I would doubt a conservator would be that careless, and that more worryingly, a determined thief could cause considerable damage if trying to subsequently remove the butt of the crowbar, they will probably wreck the um, uh, bust. This thieves, as I said, was probably the work of a group stealing to order, given that none of the monuments um, in this area has um, yet emerged. And as I say, they know what they're looking for and they come armed with tools. Uh, in one case, fortunately, they didn't succeed. This was the attempt theft of the charming late 13th century burial of a lady of the Barclay family at Cobleir in Worcestershire last October. These like, boldly wandered into the old church with tools for the job and attempted to lift the monument. In doing so, the effigy had been uprooted and the stone em um, edges had been damaged where a crowbar had been used on it. Luckily, they were either scared of being disturbed or gave up when they attempted to handle the deceptively heavy lady and looked back, back down the 100 metre walk back to the car park uh, and decided enough was enough. Fortunately, a quinquennial review was car being carried out at the time and the eagle-eyed architect spotted it was out of position. The church wardens and architects moved it into the church uh, tower and locked it up and very promptly got uh, cutters to refix it with a hidden system to prevent her from even nature. These cases underline the second aspect of the problem, viz that both brasses and carved effigies are attractive to collectors. If a carving of the calibre of the castle Froom figure, that little um, uh, military effigy bust, were to appear legally on the open market, it's unlikely that it would command a price of less than about £50,000, and some of the others would have been worth considerably more. A brass like that at Dauncey would probably cost £20,000 to £25,000 if it be sold legally, but it would fetch far more if it featured a military figure. Fragments of brasses found by tetrists frequently appear on e An average price for a single Lombardic letter is £50, and last autumn, a small portion of an inscription of unknown provenance sold for nearly £200. These sales are entirely above board, but collectors who buy such items undoubtedly help to create a market generally. If there is a market, it provides the temptation for others to steal from churches and to try and sell monuments illegally. The issue is no different from the problems arising from the sale of ancient antiquities. Monuments are, are inevitably subject to decay over time, requiring expensive conservation work to rectify, but many factors exacerbate the problem. Chief of these is poor upkeep of the church fabric, including damaged rainwater goods, block drains, and worn out pointing um, and roof problems, especially when it all results in water ingress. The consequences can be dire for monuments. High relative humidity and damp affect monuments, as internal wooden dowels and corroding metal fixings will expand. Both lead to splits in the stone, and in the case of ferrous armatures, to staining of the stone. Damp can also weaken joints made with plaster and organic adhesives, and thus endanger the structural stability of the sculpture. War monuments secured to the wall with iron fixings are particularly vulnerable, as illustrated by the monument to Bartholomew Cotton, died 1613 at St Margaret's Darston, Norfolk. Its conservation costs um, 10,235 in 2005. If affected by damp iron fixings, uh, if affected by damp, iron fixings can rust and fail, 
causing parts of monuments quite literally to fall off the wall. Congregations that re fail to rectify these problems may find that they cannot get insurance for the church and may find they have to close down their church until conservation work has been carried out. On the CC conservation panel sit on, we have had examples of that sort where really urgent remedial action is required or otherwise the church will, will cease to operate for at least a while um, as an active church and that will lead to a downward spiral. That can affect other types of monuments. Amongst restoration projects is a group of monuments in the Athelhampton Chantry in Puddletown Church in Dorset. Before the work, the monuments were in a very sorry state. The old eff effigies were a military figure and a lady of circa 1300 carved from Hamhill stone that had bu built into the base of the canopy tomb to Nicholas Martin, died 1595. This is the one on the left. The knight was against the south wall and was entirely covered by green algae. It just looks black in this, but it was actually a very dark green. A mid-14th century um, chest with another military figure was also badly affected by figuring algae. In the southeast corner of the chapel was a partly disassembled alabaster tomb <coughs> dating from the late 15th century, with two of the tomb chest panels mounted directly on the wall. Alabaster dissolved the exposed to water, and when this monument went apart for conservation, it emerged that many of the panels had dissolved from the inside outwards, as well as being broken and were in an extremely fragile state. Conservation of the monuments formed just a small part of a more wide-ranging project, to make the chapel watertight, which included work on roof timbers, drains, removing exterior pointing and replacing with lime mortar, new flagstones on half the floor, the interior plaster, and replacing with lime mortar. Only then was work on the effigies worthwhile. In their post-conservation state, they're transformed, but the entire project cost in the region of £100,000, of which some £25,000 was for the conservation of the monuments and the rest for uh, the building. This is a huge sum for a typical um, village parish church and involved a major fundraising campaign which was being obtained from both local and national sources. It would never have had without a group of volunteers in the parish. And much power to the elbow of people like them who help uh, preserve our monumental heritage and the buildings which uh, contain them. Sometimes, however, churches unwittingly score home goals, which lead to damage for, to monuments. Inappropriate floorings, especially rubber back carpets, trap moisture beneath. Churches don't have damp proof membranes like more houses and floors need to breathe, which they can't if the whole of the floor area is swathed in car like a sitting room. The surface of monuments trapped beneath suffers. Uh, ledger slabs and incised their surface detail can break down, leading to an irretrievable loss of detail. Brasses turn green with corrosion, as shown by the example at Greystock to Richard Newport, who died in 1551. This, but not the other, part can be remedied by conservation work, but again at a price. An even more worrying problem that I've heard about, um, that seems to be the case uh, certainly in East Anglia, according to Martin Stutchfield, president of the Monumental Brass Society, is that some carpenting contractors, worried about possible complaints about uneven wear to the carpets they lay down, over old floors and a speed of concrete, irrespective of whether the monuments beneath. I think in many cases parish don't even know it's being done, but this really is a dreadful thing to have. Floor tiles secured with impervious cement have the same effect. Again, it doesn't allow the feed. 
moisture is diverted into nearby walls and monuments. This is probably the cause of the deterioration of two of the important buildings in Suffolk. That to John de la Pole, the second Duke of Suffolk, who died in 21, and his wife Elizabeth of York, sister of Edward IV and Richard III, is affected by damp at low level on the carved Purbeck marble in particular. It doesn't go upwards, I think, because of imperfect um, cement being used at some stage, which is just trapped it in the bottom. And on the right-hand side in particular, a green biofilm at the eastern end, and the Purbeck marble is extremely fragile and friable, showing signs of disaggregation and fracturing, typical of Purbeck marble in damp conditions. An earlier tomb to Michael de la Pole, the second Duke of Suffolk, who, who died in 1415, and his wife Catherine, is even more badly affected by damp, where it abuts the tiled floor. On the north side the chalk chest of the chalk chest is a put in sedilia, a unique composition. Salts have clearly entered the stone, leading to powdering of the surface and loss of detail, as you could see in the detail on the right. Even the slightest touch results in the surface crumbling away. Fortunately here the church is onto the problem and is seeking the advice of a conservator, and I have no doubt we'll get the work done. There is also the issue of inappropriate cleaning. Polishing monumental brasses with proprietary cleaners um, uh, can um, wear down details, such as the delicate edging detail on the annual brass at Giggleswick uh, to the Lister family on the left. This was formerly brightly polished, as shown here, but the parish have recently been persuaded to stop this, to allow it to develop a natural patina and to retain the detail. Even worse is the case on the right of a fine alabaster monument at Beaumaris on Anglesey. The former vicar's mother regularly cleaned round the church vim and wire wall, resulting in the surface of the monument literally being dissolved away. Um, fortunately, the vicar and his mother, I think, have moved on. Possibly even worse is the use in electric, um, abrasive electric floor polishers. So lower stuff to be mistreated in this way. Uh, that on the left shows the smearing from water and scratching of, uh, sorry, on the right shows the smearing and scratching um, uh, caused by such use. And while parts of the inlay are lost, as here, tears can develop, in lieu, uh, leading to a loss of parts of the Boston and Lincolnshire is that it's damaging its, its really vital monumental heritage by using these infernal devices. Um, neither church can be persuaded to stop this practice. In Boston, they say we have a high football and it's fall and it's important to keep the floor clean. Well, Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's have a high footfall. They don't use such things. Another problem redundant churches which are sold for other purposes become redundant and are sold as we've heard earlier monuments are considered as parts of the fixtures and fittings despite their unique needs and despite the fact that post sale the monuments will not belong to the person who buys the building but to the heir at law they generally remain in the building after it's sold and they're not listed separately from the building itself, although the church commissioners can, subject to bishop's directions, remove a monument from a redundant church before it's sold, and if a new home can be found for a displaced monument. In practice, removal may occur for brasses, as has been the case for many in, um, disused Norwich churches, but not often for larger monuments. Neither the CBC nor the church commissioners keep records of any such removals, nor base monuments in former churches. It's impossible there to quantify the problem, and it's not quantifying. There's a distinction between ped many pedestrian monuments in former closed churches and some of national importance. 
there has been a succession of difficult cases recently. I show here two late 13th century effigies of ladies in Herefordshire. That at Wolfalow being of national importance, firstly because of its high sculptural quality, and secondly because it's the only known example of an effigy of a woman with the iconography of a lifting the face cloth back from the, effort, the face of the deceased. Both churches have now been closed with the effigies left in situ. Welsh bit intended for community use, though, will become a private house. The church commissioners have difficult decisions to make in such circumstances, and there are many obstacles, including costs, to moving. They have no magic wands. I must say I was particularly displayed by the decision um, not to remove the Wolfram Mon Mon Monument, although they did try. It could imprint that such mon so much lumber to be sold off with the building, whereas in this case, it's an important, valuable part of our sculptural heritage. One church promised uh, that is, oh dear, whoops, there we go. One current case promises to set even more intractable problems. Horton Church has not been used to 19, since 1998 due to falling plaster resulting in an inability to obtain into for safety reasons. In the chancel, there is a range of war monuments. None of these is significantly different in type and importance from other monuments which have been remained in churches which have been declared and redundant as sold, although as a collection they have regional significance. However, there's one more monument in the church which is of national importance, shown in this view under the um, plas uh, plastic covering. Right in the middle of the chancel is a large alabaster Renaissance tomb chest with effigies on top of a man in armour and his wife. Clearly in its present position, it would present a problem to any future owner. One solution being considered is to move it to the end of the North Isle at the new owner's expense. But it's not only the size and position of the monument which presents challenges. The monument commemorates Lord William Parr, and his wife Mary, who survived him. Parr was the uncle of Catherine Parr, the life, last wife of King Henry VIII. Monuments open windows onto our past, and some like this commemorate people who are familiar from our history books. I feel there's a strong case of Parr monument being preserved for the nation, perhaps by being removed from Horfton before it's sold, ideally, the chancel might be walled off from the rest of the building and invested in the church's conservation, even though I gather partial vesting in our current policy, as they don't like to take on. There are various strategic issues relating to monuments and other artefacts in closed buildings going into private ownership. Monuments which remain in churches after they are sold pose a challenge because covenants to ensure their continued well-being are not realistically enforceable. There's no system of monitoring whether the monuments are well preserved and whether the owners are respecting the provisions built into contracts for enabling public s. The first owner may do so, but not always. When Braysworth Church was sold in the 1970s, the interesting bars of An Alexander Newton was still in it. The new owners removed it to put on display in their farmhouse, where it is believed now to be. Perhaps, it, perhaps sometime in the future it might get sold. Who knows? Problems are even more likely further down the line. Patton Church was sold in 1974 to be used as a store. At the time, the upper half of a high-quality military effigy shown on the left built into the north of the chancel. It was removed before 1989 by the second owners. Inquiries in the village indicate that no one knows where it is now, and it must, have been, it must be presumed to have been destroyed. Again, Mansell Gamage Church was declared redundant in 1971, and is now at house. The cross slab shown on the right is of such high quality that it was illustrated in the RCH. M volume on the area, 
Before the sale, it was in the chancel against the north wall. The monument was glimpsed in 2008 outside against the south wall of the church where it is totally open to damage from wind, rain and frost, which will destroy the intercarved detail. In 1973, the church commissioners decided that Woodhorn Church should be used as a museum. Ashington UDC acquired 1973 and duly opened it as a museum which featured a large number of monuments, many from Woodhorn but also from elsewhere. This sounds like the ultimate good solution, but the museum was before January 2001 when many items were removed. Yes, others, including those shown here, remained in situ. An art gallery in the building also having failed, the local authority has attempted to sell it, but as far as is known, has been unsuccessful in finding a, a buyer willing to take it on with its restrictive covenants. More examples could be given where access difficulties have been experienced and where monuments are not being properly protected. They highlight other important issues. Owners are not at present given any guidance and care for the monument of which they will become the custodian. They are given no indication of the we caused by a quick wipe over with Mr. Muscle or the like, or by removing dust by vacuuming or using a stiff brush. Such potential abuse could be easily guarded against in the future by providing an information pact based on the Admirable Church Care website. Also, monuments are not recorded by the Land Tribunal and changes of ownership of buildings are not notified to the Church Commissioners, so there is no means of making new owners properly aware of their responsibilities. This too could perhaps be changed by including a covenant in the sale deeds. Monuments in listed buildings, whether in public or private ownership, are protected by legislation. Liberties could enforce care if notified by cases where damage is suspected. Listed building protection could be used this way, even where covenants fail, though I know of no cases where it's been done. However, not every, it's important to note that not everything in a listed building is the quality its grade suggests. This can give rise to unwarranted attention being given to mediocre artefacts in highly listed buildings and sufficient attention to outstanding pieces in unlisted buildings. Local authorities who cover a very wide range of responsibilities don't always understand the difficulties and generally assume retention in situ is the best option, whatever the context or particular issues. This does raise the question of where leaving monuments in former churches really is the best long-term solution, or whether it would be more appropriate and in the public to re relocate more ones before the initial takes place, although I reiterate that will not be easy. The most serious problem of the good preservation of many monuments is bat damage. Bat urine and feces are extremely damaging to church monuments, as indeed they are to other important artefacts in churches. Bat urine decays to form dilute ammonia. It's chemically aggressive and can cause pitting, staining or etching of poor, polished or porous materials. Monumental brasses are particularly badly affected by the urine as it uh, results in this spot appearance to the monuments um, of, for example, this and many other brasses. When I lived in Norfolk in the early 1980s, I spent a lot of my t spare time rubbing brasses. At that time, none that I recall was damaged by bats. Today, most Norfolk churches house colonies of bats, and it's rare to find a brass that has not been damaged as a result. This is true for many other parts of the country also. Sculptured monuments are also damaged by bat urine and feces. The small number of medieval wooden effigies surviving in this country are susceptible to damage to the pattern of the surface, which has been built up over the centuries. Urine can also harm precious original paint and other surface finishes on historic monuments. 
and build up a thesis on porous stones of monuments, especially marble and alabaster, is also extremely problematic. The accretion hardens, and if it's then subject to moisture, which of course is common in churches, it can cause marked discoloration and other harm. This is illustrated by a white marble effigy at Stanford on Avon, Northamptonshire. They had a major conservation program some years ago, but the church, you can see what the bats are doing and just the sheer amount of um, uh, bat droppings that there are. Um, but the church authorities have been told that to clean up just this one monument could cost them in the region of £15,000. The church has a nationally important mission of exceptionally fine monuments, but also houses colonies over f of over 400 pipistrel bats and other species in lesser numbers, which are causing soiling and degradation of all fabric. Numbers there are increasing every year and the parish is at its wit's end. A two-year project funded by National England and English Heritage helped with limited cleaning and covering of certain monuments, but this has now ended. The heated bat box, which was installed as part of it, has not reduced bat numbers, and they still fly throughout the whole church. Now that the church members are to take back cleaning responsibility, they are anxious about the health risks in particular, with inhalation of bat dropping through the nose and mouth. This is a church that could face eventual closure, is not done. And it is a very, very important one. Monuments can be protected to an extent by covering them with sheets of stick, but this is unsightly, it prevents them from being seen and enjoyed by congregations and the wider public, and creates a damp microclimate which leads to other conservation issues. Stamford-on-Avon is by no means an isolated case. Elleburn near Pickering, North Yorkshire, is another church where the congregation was driven out of the church after bats adopted as a habitat tw some 12 years ago. It now acts as a home for hundreds of bats, and the fabric and furnishings are suffering as a result. Moreover, some members have fallen ill after coming into contact with the bats' waste. The financial cost has been huge. Parishioners raised £10,000 to construct sites in a nearby barn and a heated lich gate, but the bats didn't move. In total, £29,000 has been spent so far by the congregation to try and solve the problem. A huge sum for such a tiny place. Yet after a very long campaign, finally got a promise from Natural England to, li a license, to grant a license to block up some of the entry points in the church. Um, it's yet to be delivered. Another example is Home Hell in Norfolk, a fine church with interesting memorial slabs. The bats added 260 natura roost in the net and so are free to yaw over the interior church raising concerns about increasing levels of damage, filth, smell, and health and safety risks, especially when small children are concerned. The decision was taken to employ a firm of commissioned cleaners to clean the church up to the height of the roof timbers at a cost of £2,250, but this was a temporary solution only. I've been told that in the circumstances, the congregation would prefer to abandon the church and worship in the church hall. Bats are a protected species under European and national law. Of course it is important that our nat native species should be protected, but I firmly believe that a much more realistic balance needs to be struck between bats' needs and the protection of our national heritage and the health of people visiting and attending churches. The CBC has long been grappling with this thorny issue, but they really do face an uphill struggle. Yet the longer it takes us to tackle this problem, the more damage that will be done to our church treasures, and the greater the bill that ordinary parish churches will have to face. We must wake up to the fact that we cannot, just cannot afford for our historic churches to be turned into bat arms. Thank you.